Amen. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. Let's just say a quick word of prayer. As we go into your word, we pray for understanding. We ask, Lord, that your light will shine upon our path and that we will not just be hearers of your word, but we will be doers of your word in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come breathe upon the word that we will hear today. Let the word mightily grow in our hearts and let it bear fruit in the name of Jesus. Father, we say thank you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many people have been reminded of something they forgot before in scriptures today? Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to second Sunday in, in August. It's still our month of glorious grace. And last week we were looking at the concept of grace. How many people went back home to read some of those scriptures? Be bold. The righteous is as bold as a lion. Raise up your hand. Hallelujah. How many people did not even open it? Oh my goodness. I'm tempted to ask us why, but because I don't want you to break my heart any further, I would excuse that. Um, but we had said that yesterday, um, last week Sunday, we had looked at grace. We had looked at some of the things that the grace of God is and some of the things that the grace of God is not. Um, today we were supposed to exchange notes based on our studies. I will quickly um, do like a summary and then we will go into today properly. Holy Spirit helping me. Okay, so last week we looked at what the grace of God is and we said that change holiness or Christ-likeness is not a requirement for grace. It is actually the result of grace. So grace does not demand that you change for it to be at work in you. Grace is what brings about the change that people see in you. It's actually the grace of God that teaches a believer not to sin. And that's found in Titus 2, verses 11 to 12. Please write these scriptures down so you can go home and study for yourself. Like Nazario said, you go home and meditate and regurgitate. So that if someone comes to tell you, let me show you a higher level of grace because I'm holier than you, you will let the person know that the grace of God has been available to all men. And therefore, you are a recipient of that grace. But if you don't know, then you will be confused. The Bible says that when the purpose, of, no, not the Bible, sorry. There's a popular saying that when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. That's why people sometimes struggle with sin and they allow the devil, the accuser of the brethren, to beat them down because they don't know what they have become. So please write the scriptures down. So the grace of God is actually what teaches us not to sin. Titus 2 verses 11 to 12. The grace of God is Jesus because Jesus is the fullness of grace. The Bible says that it was full of grace or it is full of grace and truth and that it is of his fullness that you and I have received grace for grace. That is in John 1 verses 14 to 17. So when you and I receive Christ, we receive grace, right? Um, what else? We said that the grace of God right? One of the things it does is that it corrects you. We look at John 7, the story of the Samaritan woman. And then we said that you haven't received this grace. We should also grace others, right? We looked at 1 Corinthians 5 verses 1 to 5 when there was immorality in the church. And we looked at how Paul told the church to address this. Um, we also looked at 2 Corinthians 2 verses 7 to 11. Um, yeah, we spoke about... We so, spoke about the fact that you cannot out the grace of God. That's in Romans 5, verses 20. So there is no sin you can commit that the grace of God has not made provision for. As a matter of fact, the law came to show us what sin is. And according to scriptures, when you break the law, you are, when you break one of the law, you have broken all the law. So you know those people that say that my own sin is small sin, your own sin is big sin. It's a lie. There's no big sin, there's no small sin. The person that lie and the person that commits murder, you are all in the same category. Yeah, it's not me, you know this, but we are all in the same, yeah. But the good news is that the grace of God has made provision for every sin. And that's in Romans 5 verses 20. We spoke about the grace of God giving us a new identity, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 16. Um, then we looked at 2 Peter 1 verses 2 to 4 
talking about how the grace of God makes provision for more than just your sin or more than teaching you righteousness. It gives you all that pertains to life and godliness. It gives you access to the exceeding great and precious promises of God. It makes you a partaker of the divine nature of God and helps us to escape the corruption that is in this world. All that I just said now is in 2 Peter. All of that is accessible in the grace of God, right? And then we looked at the fact that um, God has made this grace available for us and with it, it freely gives us all things. Romans 8 verses 32. It says that he that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So we looked at the fact that by Jesus, who is full of grace, we have access to all things that God has access to or all things that God has created. We looked at how the grace of God makes allowances for thorns in our flesh as believers. We looked at 2 Corinthians 12 verses 7 when um, Paul prayed that Jesus would take away the thorn from him and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And we um, concluded that some of the answers to some of the things that we pray for is grace. So Thankfully, the thorn was not stated whether it was a physical or a spiritual or mental kind of thorn. So we all can fit in whatever it is that is a thorn in our flesh into it. And the response of God remains that the grace of God is always sufficient for me. And we also learned from Paul that what you do with your thorn is that you take it to God in prayer. Um, I think that's where we stopped, right? Research how should we position? Okay, yeah, that's where, okay. Yeah, I was going to come. That's, that's where I'm going to land. Or that's where I really want to start from, the, from today. So how should we position ourselves? Or you ask yourself, so if the grace of God undoes everything, what should be my posture? And as I was meditating on this, um, one of the things God was teaching me, which I'm going to be sharing with us today is, you know, I told you this is my meditation, Abby, because the thing for the month confused me as it confused some of us. Um, so, if Jesus is the fullness of grace, you receive grace as you receive Jesus. Now, the reason some of us don't then manifest the grace is not because it's not there. It's because we haven't fully received it. Now, I discover in studying scriptures, looking at Hebrews 4, where we read that it says that come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy that you may obtain. Obtain them means receive. Receive them means lambano. Now here's the difference, right? Mo and I use the illustration of the bottle of water that I asked blessing for. So when she gave me this bottle, I received it, right? Which is the first level of receiving that all Christians do when we receive Christ. That receiving of Christ is called the komai which means to receive what you do not have. Am I confusing you? Okay, so dekomai means I'm thirsty. I don't have water. I was dead without Christ. Then I receive Christ. It's a passive kind of receiving that does not necessarily involve anything active from you except to collect it, right? But now that I have the water, as it quenched my thirst... Why hasn't it quenched my, my thirst? Because I have not received it. Are you with me? So, when Hebrews says that we should come boldly, the receiving them means to lambano. It means to lay hold on. Lambano means that what is yours already, you then come to the knowledge of it. And you then actively take possession of it. So you can be full of grace, yet your life will be graceless. Do you understand what I mean? You can be full of the grace of God, yet there will be no evidence or tangibility of that grace because you are yet to lay hold on it. And so when Christ says that we should come boldly to the throne of mercy, it's not to receive the grace that you don't already have. Right? It's to come to the awareness of that which you already have. And begin to lay hold on it. You see, the difference between the lambano and the decoma is that when you lambano it, you begin to talk like it, you dress like it, you act like it, you think like it, because it, it's a verb, right? And we know, we all went to school, a verb is an 
action word or a... So you cannot lambano and still be idle doing nothing with what you have received. So if you say, I have the grace for... Give me grace. What grace do you want to receive now? You have the grace for excellence. Now, you cannot have the grace for excellence. Yeah, okay, let's say excellency in what? In tailoring. I'll be cooking. I'll be... See, because you like food. Excellency in cooking, right? You cannot say, I have received the grace for excellency in cooking, and you will not go to the kitchen. Grace will not go and measure the rice. Eh, and, and grace will not say, you pour the salt like the way your grandmother used to pour it. Our grandmother said they were excellent cook. Sorry, mama. Because I have grandma that used to cook great. Right? Grace means that you have received it. You now begin to act like it. What happens is you are now in tune. That's why the Bible says you should come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy. Because what happens is when you come, God reminds you of what you have. When he reminds you, you are already engaging in a conversation with him. So he will not tell you that sort of do. That pepper of do. Uh-huh. Then excellency comes into place then direction comes into place because you have received it from God. You have received it not passively as ki sera, sera, whatever. You know, I found um, something in scripture. Please open your Bibles with me to Acts 8. I found a perfect example of it in Acts 8. Um, I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. I want to finish talking in five minutes so we can open it up. Acts 8. Okay, this was talking about the Spirit of God. <clears throat> it says, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of, the, of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. We see two received there, right? Those two receive means two different things. What is receive? So if you read it, you will say they received. Because the question is, if they had received the word of God, which means they had received Christ, why were they coming to receive the Holy Spirit again? Are there two receiving? No. But the definition of receive here means two different things. So when he said that they had received the word of God, they had decommied it, meaning that they did not have it before it had been introduced to them. So when Paul came, he saw that even though they had received the word, it was not profiting them. It wasn't tangible, right? And then he now came to Lambano, or they then Lambano. It's not that Paul brought the Holy Spirit with them. I don't want to confuse you because all this Greek and Hebrew. They had the Holy Spirit. Technically, it should have been working in them. But when Paul came, there was no fruit of what they had received. Then he asked. Okay, so he says that then when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for at yet it had fallen, for he had fallen upon none of them. They only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When they lay hands on them, they received Lambano, the Holy Spirit. Now, 18 says, and when Simon saw, that through the hands of the apostles, or through the laying on of the apostles' hand, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money. Stay with me. They had received the word of God, right? But it was not profiting them. So when Paul came, Paul did not bring the Holy Spirit from Judea, from Jerusalem to Samaria, right? What he did was he quickened that which was already on the inside of them. Now, why that receiving is different was before Simon had been in that country, even though they had received the word of God, he didn't see a change in their life. But the moment they were quickened, right, Simon saw that now there is something about them that they did not have before. And because he saw it, he said, can I buy it with money? And scripture says, let your money perish with you, right? So often I hear people, you know, you receive the grace of God. But let, let's not go into that money part. But let's focus on the grace of God. So what makes the grace of God active on the inside of you or what part do you have to play to activate or take possession of the grace is that you come to the throne of grace and mercy and you lay hold of it. And when you lay hold of it, it changes the way you talk. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you perceive things. When you go out, there is a new confidence that you have because you know that it's not going to be by your might. It's not going to be by your power. Now, grace does not displace 
the place of diligence. So I hear people say, ah, I'm graced. You are sloppy. That's not it. Right? Grace does not, dis- and that's why Paul will say that I am what I am by the grace of God, but I work hard more than you. Even that hardness of working or that hard work is by the grace of God. So the grace of God requires you to work hard. Let me tell your neighbor that the grace of God requires you to work hard. So you can receive grace for excellence in school, grace for excellence in business, but that grace places a demand on you to do extra. So when people are sloppy, graces places a demand on you to do more. Right, and then when you do more, grace will then, uh, what's the English word now? Will make bigger the things that you are doing. And the people will be like, ah, I did it as you did it. Uh, it's the same didn't. But the difference in our didn't is that I have grace with my own didn't. You understand? Uh-huh. It's not the didn't that you understand, it's the grace one. <laughs> do you get? So grace will not say, because you are graced, do nothing about it. Because grace will be seen. Do you understand what I mean? So grace will require that you put, oh my time is, grace will require that you put work into it. It will require of you to be diligent. Grace is what will make Jesus wake up before the disciples and go and pray. And he will leave the crowd and he will not say, I am the fullness or the fullness of God is in me or I am God and I am man. So any demon, technically if Jesus did not pray, he would have still casted out the demons because it's the word of God himself. But grace will place that demand to spend time communing with the Father. And he will come out and say, what I see my Father do, I do. <clears throat> and that's why you see miracles that his disciples cannot do, he will do. Because grace has made a demand of diligence on him. So grace will, de- will require of you to be more hardworking, will require when people are putting shorter time, you put more time. And that's why the Bible says that see a man diligent in all his ways. He says he will not stand before mere men, he will stand before kings. And my prayer for us is that we will not just be aware or receive no- head knowledge of this grace. We will lay hold of it. We will be active with this grace. We will use it. You know, I, I was at an interview this um, during the week, and they were asking me some questions that in my head I was not thinking. You know when somebody asks you a question, you don't even know the answer. In fact, you don't even understand the question. I was like, oh, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. And then when I was answering, the person was like, wow. In my head, I was like, you are talking the nonsense. <laughs> but this was like, wow, wow, interesting. I'm like, really? I wish I recorded what I said, because how did you know? And it's not because I did not prepare. I was prepared. But when the person wanted to daru, mommy loved you, the grace of my inside said, God forbid. Do you get what I mean? So you be prepared, but then the grace of God on your inside. And you know the, what the grace of God sometimes does? It gives you expo. Before you get there, you know the question. So as you're asking, you just be like, yeah. You know, those lecturers that tell you don't read chapter five. Exam will not come from chapter five. Then the Holy Spirit will tell you to read chapter 5. Because God will punish the devil of the lecturer. Because the question 1 is chapter 5 and it's compulsory for all. So that's what the grace of God does. It brings to your mind those things. But you have to come boldly to the throne of grace. And then you receive it. You lay, And that's the same thing it is for anything that you want in God. You have to. You see, everything that God will give a believer, he has already given them. I want you to say your neighbor, wealth is in you already. Prosperity is in you already. Healing is in you already. Deliverance is in you already. New beginning is in you already. Victory is in you already. So I guess the question is, are you leaving all of that? Because the moment you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive all all of the package of Jesus. You receive all of the package of everything that God can give you. But our expressions of it will differ as we actively receive or actively lay hold on that which he has given to us. 
And that's what makes a difference in the life of a believer. And that's why you see like, it looks like some people are more graced or prospering or doing excellently than others. Not because they done anything to deserve it is because they have come to the knowledge and that's why if you see one prayer of Paul for the church every time he prays for them what does he pray for? Knowledge he prays that your eyes of understanding will be enlightened that you will grow in the knowledge of God why? once you know you become and that's why the Bible says that those that know their God if you become before knowing there will be a mistake you will not sustain it. See, some of us want to be before we know. And that's why our success is like Nepalites. It they off our own. But when you know, then you be. When you be, doing is easy. In fact, some of us make it worse. We want to do before we be. But that's a disorder. You see, I, I, I read um, an interview by Bill Gates one time. And someone asked him and said, what will happen if you lose all the money you have right now? And he looked at the interview and he smiled and he said, I will make it all over again. I don't know if he's a born again Christian. But what confidence in who he is that he is not afraid that he will lose what he has acquired because he knows how to reacquire it. Some of us cannot even tell our neighbor our dream. Because your neighbor will steal it. But when we know we are sure of who we are and who is on our inside, then it's easy to be and it's easy to do. And when someone steals your idea, you, you implement that same idea with your USP. You know what's our USP as Christian? We have grace. I think it should be GSP. I have great selling points. So where everybody fail, I go there and I show my GSP. It differentiates us. That's what we have as believers. That's, you know, it, in Old Testament, when they didn't even have the Holy Spirit resident on their inside like you and I do, right? When it comes upon them, it's different. You will know that this Holy Spirit has come upon. Now, how much more the Holy Spirit that has permanent address is not parent? Or he has paid perpetual rent. It's permanently on the inside of you. Our world should know. But what happens is when you don't know who is on your inside, you cannot even use him. And that's what it means to receive grace. Know who is on your inside. Don't try to work some things in your own strength. Just receive grace. Allow the Holy Spirit direct us. And that's what God is calling us to today. And so what should our response be when we know that we can receive grace or we know that this grace is resident in our inside and we have come to lay hold actively on him? Allow this grace to be manifested in you. Allow this grace. It's like if I say I'm thirsty, right? Um, I don't know if we have any doctors in the house. Most times when you're thirsty, your saliva is thicker, right? Once you drink water, what happens? It goes back to normal pH, that's the same thing. When the Holy Spirit comes and you allow it to work, except you are sick and your body is rejecting the water, right? If we allow it to work, it should be dif- something should be different about us. So the way we do things should be different because now you are led by the Spirit. Now you have grace. So you go to a difficult situation and you know, I have Christ in me. And remember that this gift of grace has been given to us all freely. And it's not dependent on how holy you are. This gift has been given to us. You don't have to merit it. You don't have to do anything to get it. But you cannot be ignorant. And I think that that's one thing that the devil works on Christians the most. He makes us too busy to read our Bible so that you are ignorant of what you have. And then you go and you say, I'm hustling. And then your hustle will not pay. Meanwhile, you can go to where people are hustling and you find favor. Because all of that is embedded in grace. Right, but if you don't know when you should, it's like if I knew that Bumi had five hundred thousand naira now and I need thank you, the way I would ask him would be different because I know. But if I'm thinking that ah, maybe Shakpa have catch him. If I want to ask now, I would just be like ah, do you have like can you help me? You know, and so when you know what you carry, you are confident. Why am I reiterating this point? I want us to get to the point where we are confident of the grace of God that is on our inside. 
And we are so confident of it that we lay hold on it and that in any endeavor, we actually utilize the grace. That's why Pastor Taiwo has been reiterating glorious grace so that we can come to the awareness of what we carry. And you want, I can use it. Um, I want to open the mic up and then I would round off. If there's anyone that has read any of the scriptures, um, um, I'll open that up and then we'll come and round off. Anyone wants to share what the Lord has? You've read the scriptures on grace and there's something in your heart that is in the bone. I want to share with the church on grace. Or questions. Yeah, or you have a question on grace. Someone asked at Word Wednesday that does grace of God license us to sin? What's the answer? Say it boldly if you know the answer. Yeah. So the grace of God does not license us to sin. Um, I guess that's the simple answer to it. Yeah. Any question on grace? Any comments? Yes. Okay, so uh, I want to ask, according to Hebrews 4.16 that we went through, that says, let us therefore come boldly. So I want to um, boldly, I want to ask, why sh- is the word boldly even there when it is more or less like it's my coming to the throne of grace is more or less like I'm going, coming to the presence of God. So why the word boldly, one, and also obtain mercy and find grace, the difference between mercy, because sometimes I think in prayers, when we pray, sometimes we're like, okay, maybe it's mercy I should ask for, or it's grace I should ask for, so like, what's the difference between mercy and grace? And then why do we think, or why was the word, why did Paul write boldly there? Okay, I think mercy and grace was actually addressed at Word Wednesday, I believe. Um, okay, so mercy and grace oftentimes work together. Now, the most basic definition of mercy is you not getting what you deserve. So let's say, we gonna deserve slap, for example. It's like some people want to slap. The mercy of God or mercy will say that I should not slap her even though she's deserving of the slap. But because our God is a God of Jara, he will not just leave you at not getting slap that you deserve. He will say give her a hug. So they are called police Do you understand what what the difference is? So, often time, mercy introduces grace. Now, do you know why the law was given? If you don't know what Jesus is saving you for, you cannot appreciate the gift that Jesus has come to give us. So, the law did not come to help us not to sin. The law came to show us that it's a must. You must to sin. And you cannot achieve righteousness by your power. So you must need Jesus. That's the purpose of the law. It didn't come to say, that don't, do not steal. It's because you will steal. You know the way we are. If I say, everybody don't look back. It's just human nature. You now want to see what's going on. Why, why does she want, why does she not want us to see? If some people have looked back with their heart. Your head is like this, but your eye is like this. That is why grace and mercy works together. So mercy come to say, this is what you deserve. I'm not going to give you, but I am grace. The one you don't deserve that you know that you should not get. Maybe not even just give her a hug. You might even say I should give her money. Are you... <laughs> so do we understand the concept of grace and mercy? And that's why God does not just show us mercy alone. When he shows you mercy, it comes with grace. And even if you get just mercy, God will never show you grace without showing you mercy. Because grace is getting what you don't deserve. Right? But you have to not get what you deserve first to now get what you don't deserve. So we understand the... Amen. Then why did he say we should come boldly? You come boldly because you have already... I don't know Hebrew word. Dekumaidit. Do you understand? Like I said, right? If this book you are holding is mine, the way I come to say, Bumi, give me the book, is different from if it's not mine. Are you with me? 
if I know that this book is mine, I'm the one that gave you. I'll just say, bring me my book. If sometimes I will not even talk, I'll just collect and be going because it's mine. So when God says, come boldly to the throne of grace, because you have already decommied grace in Christ Jesus. So when you come, you come with an assurance that I am receiving, not I am coming to beg for you to give me what I don't have. Do you get? So that's why he's saying, come boldly to receive what you already have. And that is the assurance that you will get it because if I give you the book, I say give me back, you don't give me. Tendency, I will call a slap. The boldness that I will use to give you slap is because I know that it is mine. And that's why we come boldly to the throne of grace because it is already ours. And we are just coming to lay hold of it for any time that we need it. Amen. Do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, um, my question is in two ways. Um, as a Christian, at what point can we start receiving grace? And the other way is, as a Christian, should we do we need to request for more grace or just the non-Christians? I don't know if you understand. Okay, I get your point. Okay, first of all, you said as a Christian... When do we start receiving grace? I think we should all answer. As a Christian, when do you start receiving grace? The moment you gave your life to Christ and you receive Christ. John 1.14 says, Christ is full of grace. And of his fullness, you and I have received grace for grace. So, once you are a Christian, you have already received grace. It's like saying, I'm sure my father born me. But is he my father? You see that there's an identity crisis there. Do you understand what I'm explaining? No, you can sit down. God bless you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So as a Christian, once you because what makes you a Christian is that you have received Christ. So as a Christian, you already have the fullness of grace. But that receiving of that fullness is what we call the Kumai, which is act, passive receiving. What you don't have before you received it. Right? So when you come to ask God for grace, what you come to do is you now lay hold and say, it is mine. I walk it. And that's why it looks like it produces for more people than the other because some other people are very conscious of it. They want to carry leg. They say it's by the grace of God. And that's why the Bible says that, you know, when you want to say, I will see you tomorrow, it says you have to say it's by the grace of God. Because now you are in Christ Jesus. And that's why Paul will say, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live this life. I live by faith in Christ Jesus. So if I'm alive now, it's grace. So anything I'm doing now is supposed to be grace. But if I am not aware of it, I will live ordinary. Whereas grace is available. So we will get to heaven and we will see Christians that could have done more with the grace of God, but did not do it. Will they make heaven? Yes. It should have been that they unfortunately did not maximize the grace of God on earth. Um, okay, let me give another example. You know some people, when they buy shoe, you wear it that the person that manufactured the shoe should come and collect money from you. I had one shoe like that when I was growing up. I wore it so bad that one of my friends had to ask me, do you not have any more shoe? Actually, you are not wrong because at that time, it's only one. Now, the same pair of shoes that I use my money. Some other person will buy it and wear it only once. Did we pay the same amount? Most likely. Did we both have the shoe? Yes. Who used the shoe more? So the question is, who used grace more? If you want to also continue hustling. Some of us, let grace be doing the hustle. Do you get the difference? Amen. Any other question? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so um, we've already established that bad things don't come from God. Um, God gives us the grace to go through them. I'm very sure a lot of us will be asking, so why do, does God allow bad things to happen to good Christians? That maybe yeah, it's obvious this person has the grace of God. This person is walking in favor. This person is... Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Okay, let me, let me come to that. Um, you know, one thing I've realized is Sometimes what we call bad is a matter of perspective. I'll be honest with you. 
Um, sometimes the reason we go through certain difficult situations, let me use the word difficult, is because one, either God wants to build character in us, or God wants to take you to a deeper level of faith in him, right? If we understand that God is good, and that's why Romans 8 says, and all things work together for good to those who love God and who were called according to his purpose. If you and I will look at the death of Christ without understanding the full purpose of the birth of Christ, we will say his death was wicked. True or false? Because, I mean, if you want to kill him, kill him. Why do they have to beat him with thorn? Put, have you put thorn near your head before? He, he had a thorn of crown on his head. They stretched him to nail him to the cross. Put nail. You spin to prick yourself. They hit the nail till he went in. It was so bad that he couldn't even stand straight. He had to slouch because the more oxygen he got into his lungs, that's how difficult it was for him to breathe. And then you ask yourself, God, just Kukuma, let him sleep and now we go. I you have died. He died, he died, he died. Do you understand? Right? So sometimes when we, if we don't understand the big picture, we assume that certain things are bad. In another story that I like to say is the butterfly, right? I've said it here before. When a butterfly is about to emerge, it has to break out from the cocoon that it's in. And they'll tell you that it's the most gruesome thing for the butterfly because it has to keep pushing out until it's able to come. And then I read the story of a young boy that had caught a little pupa and put in a jar. And so when his mom was not around, he saw the butterfly trying to come. And the boy was just so compassionate, like the way we are. And he was like, oh, this butterfly is going through so much. It must be an Oyibo boy. I trust Nigerian. So the boy was like, oh, no. So he opened the jar and helped the butterfly to break out of the shell. And the butterfly could never fly. Because the process of breaking out of that hard shell was what he was using to develop the wings so that when he comes, when he emerges, he's able to fly. But that butterfly never could fly. So that's why I said that sometimes until we get a God perspective of things. And that's why God says we should come together in the place of prayer. One thing I tell people is when you go to God in prayer, don't just reel out your prayer points. Because the prayers that get answered is according to his will. So when you get to the place of prayer, and you know what is even interesting? Sometimes the general will of God in the Bible for you will be different from the specific will of God for you in that season. So the general will of God might be that you blow, you have money. And then God said, if I give you money now, the spirit of OBO will enter you. So God will say, just wait. Before I give you money, let me first build character in you. Let me first build honesty in you. Let me first build self-control in you. So what people see is that you are suffering. What God sees is a, belief, is a millionaire in training. Do you get what I mean? What people see is that Sakpa is your middle name. What God sees is a billionaire in training. And when you go to the place of prayer, that's why you will hear when they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, Lazarus is dead. He said, no, you have a man's perspective of Lazarus' situation. Lazarus is sleeping. And then he said, let's go and wake him up. Did they wake Lazarus up? So when you go to God in prayer, you get a God perspective of the situation. And so when you get a God perspective of the situation, most likely than not, you will not call it a bad thing. Because there is no bad in God. So does the devil sometimes bring bad situation Christians way? Yes. But you know it's not of God. So when you take it to God in prayer, God turns the situation around. Do we understand? Amen. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes. We'll do this. One, two, three. I will round up this service. If you have any more questions, um, all the HODs, please stand up. Walk up to any of them. Or you can walk up to me after service. We'll have a chat. So, like you said, you said, um, as a believer, God has given us a gift, which is grace. So, and which differentiates us when we go to a place, uh, when we go to a place, people, we are, we are unique. But my question is, so when believers come together, is there higher grace? Is there something that differentiates one person to another? Okay, so when a believer comes together, is the gathering of graces. 
So the Bible says, oh, by the way, they wanted to call today's service gathering of graces. When believers come together is gathering of graces, right? But I said, even as a believer, you can operate in different dimensions of the grace. It is dependent on your level of knowledge and your willingness to lay hold on what you have. If I decide to finish this bottle of water, it's my choice. What it does is that it increases the liquidity in my system. If I decide to drink just a sip, it's still my choice. It does not change the fact that I have a full bottle. It just determines how much of it I have working within me. So we can all gather here and you have usage of one percentage, 50%, 10%, 100%. It depends on the user. And that's why God is a God of individuality. You don't come to accept Christ as a family unit. Right? You must confess with your own mouth. Right? Yeah. I hope you understand what I mean. Amen. Um, Stephen and then him. Stephen, stand up. They'll see you. Okay. How would I say this now? Okay. You know how it is when you see someone that is not a Christian and you perceive the spirit of God in the person. Um, I don't know how it sounds to you, but there are some certain persons that I've met and I see them experience typical grace that has been taught by Christianity and by our, our role models and elders and everybody, teachers. Um, my question is, is grace the knowing of Christ or is just specifically for Christians because uh, sorry but I, I don't know I'm finding it difficult to express because it might not be um, Bible says that the grace of God has been made available to all men now that's the saving grace of God right um, and then there's the fullness of grace which is Christ Jesus so can an unbeliever let me use unbeliever someone that does not believe in Christ um, manifest the fullness of grace. It's not possible because you don't have Christ and Christ is the fullness of grace. Can an unbeliever, you know, see what we sometimes allude to as grace are the benefits of grace. So we say, you know, when you are grace, you are excellent on your job, you are prosperous, right? Those are the things that we see and we conclude as grace, right? But the thing is that you can be excellent and not be a Christian. Do you get what I mean? That does not mean you are graced. It just means maybe you're very smart or you're very intelligent. So you have people like that. But when we interpret it, because we have defined grace as maybe excellency, prosperity, we say we see grace on their life. The only person that you can say you see grace on his or her life is the person that has Jesus because Jesus is the fullness of grace, right? So grace is the ability of God that comes and makes a difference in the life of a man, for lack of a better one. That's why uh, people have also defined grace as not getting what you deserve, right? It's God looking and saying, I'm going to give you much more. Some people have also defined grace as unmerited favor, right? All of that is embedded in Christ, or you can only access through Christ. So if a man does not have Christ, you cannot have the fullness of grace. Do you understand what I'm saying? But you can decide not to have Christ and be prosperous, and have money. You can't even have the fullness of prosperity, but you can have money. You can be healthy. You know, do you get what I mean? You can live a soft life. Do you understand? So that's why I said it can't even be the fullness because prosperity must include the prosperity of your soul. Do you get what I mean? And that's why um, I think it was James that says that I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. So if you have financial prosperity, but your soul is not prospering, how does your soul prosper? You have come to the knowledge of Christ. You have accepted the righteousness of Christ. And then you know that your spirit man is then influencing your flesh and your soul, you know, is being transformed or being renewed, right? Do you understand what I'm explaining? I'm giving you a short form of the short form. If you want long, what Wednesday will undo that? <laughs> have I answered you? Amen. Um, yes. And that's the last one. Thank you very much, Ma. We've emphasized on grace in Jesus. Yes. Jesus brought grace to us. So my concern is what happened to grace before Jesus in the Old Testament? Was there grace? You want to go to the Old Testament? No, ma. I'm just <laughs> concerned. If they, did they benefit grace? Because we see the stories of David. Yeah. And the okay, so um, grace, um, like we said, you receive grace, right, by coming boldly 
and receiving it. Now, if you come boldly, is that you believe that you are going to receive. Remember I said that you receive grace when you receive Christ. How do you receive Christ? Romans 10, 10 says, with the heart, man believes. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Hebrews 11 thought about, talked about the people that received grace. He says that, and Abraham, what? Believed God. And it was accounted to him as righteousness. So they won't have received Christ like we have with his fullness, but they received this ability for the saving grace of God. Do you understand? And that's what the Bible says, that Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him as righteousness. So you receive grace as you believe, as you receive Christ. How do you receive Christ? You believe in your heart and you confess. And when you come boldly to the throne of grace, you believe that's the confidence that you're going to receive, right? And then you come. Can you come to the place of prayer and keep your mouth shut? If your mouth is shut, your mind must be speaking. You, you know, sometimes you, you can't speak out where you are, but in your mind you're like, oh God, help me, help me. And he does help you. And that's, about, that's why the Bible says that beyond what you can ever ask, think, or imagine, right? So those are the um, um, parameters that God uses or that we use to commune with God. What we ask, what we think, what we imagine, right? So, Because I know some Christians that if you're in a, Christa, a Christian in the midst of Muslims, if you pray out, they can tear you slap. I had a friend like that too. If he's in public like this, he doesn't know how to pray with his mouth open because for the longest time before he was able to convert his family, he couldn't pray out loud. God still answered him. Do you get what I mean? I've answered your question. So they believed God. Believe. If you don't believe, you cannot receive Christ. If you don't receive Christ, you cannot receive grace. So you believe, you confess. Then after receiving grace, you now begin to act it out. Let him influence, you know, how you walk, talk, and all of that. Um, have we been blessed today? Amen. I just want us to bow our head and say, God, help me. I lay hold on the grace, on the fullness of grace in the name of Jesus. Remember, it's one thing to receive as you don't have. It's another thing to actively lay hold on it. Say, God, I receive your grace. I actively lay hold on this grace in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your grace. We give you all the glory, honor, and adoration. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we've prayed.